So I'd like to begin, we've, we've been doing this, I guess, review or overview of the book of Proverbs over the past uh, probably eight weeks or so. We're up to chapter seven. But I'd like to begin, first of all, you know, Proverbs has a lot of things about wisdom. We see a lot of wisdom. This is the wisdom book. Solomon, we've talked about, he was a wise man, one of the wisest men who lived. I'd say next to Jesus, he was the wisest man who ever walked on the earth, other than Jesus himself. And when we look at these, through these texts, it brought to mind a lot of different things as I studied through Proverbs chapter 7. And I, I thought of this experience that happened to a man in New York City. I don't know if you looked or not, but the... Uh, the topic today is entitled Safety and Wisdom. Safety and Wisdom. And if you look up safety things, you'll find that you know, there are a lot of precautions that are taken, whether if you're on a, a work site, you may have to wear a hard hat. You may have to wear steel-toed shoes. You may be required to wear gloves at certain times. And sometimes we look at these things and we think they're so restrictive. It's so restrictive. When I wear gloves, it's just hard for me to work. When I, these steel-toed shoes are just so heavy to walk around in. This hard hat just gets in my way. The safety glasses, Rick's pulling his glasses out. Sometimes we have to wear safety glasses. And it's, it gets annoying sometimes because you sweat. The sweat gets on the glasses. Dust, sawdust in your job gets on them. But how many times have you had those glasses on and it saved your eye? How many times has a hard hat saved someone's life? Or steel-toed shoes save them from losing a toe or possibly a foot. And there was a man in New York City that was working on one of these window scaffoldings that go up and down. And he always, he'd been doing this job for many years and he had talked about how OSHA's been all over them to have these safety harnesses and how restrictive these harnesses are and how he can't move around when he's, he's doing these different jobs on the, cleaning the windows of the skyscrapers. And he happened to be one day at the 27th floor, which, you know, it's 270 feet. But when you're working on a 1,000-foot building, that's not very high. But it's high enough that if you fall, it's going to kill you. And he's working on the 27th floor, and he's there, and him and his partner, and his partner's wearing a safety harness, and he's not. And he's, they're doing their job, and they're just ha having a good day. And all of a sudden, a bird flies through and he lost his balance and he dropped his device, whether it was a squeegee or a sponge, I'm not sure, but he dropped it. And in trying to recover it, he reached over and he flips over the edge of the scaffolding that he was working on. And his friend just happened to reach out and grab him and he happened to catch on to the railing just in time. And there he was hanging 270 feet above the concrete surface. That restrictive harness wasn't hooked to him. Was that harness a restriction at that moment? Would it have been? No, because even if his friend hadn't caught him, guess what would have happened? He would have, he would have stopped. It would have held him. He would have caught right onto the side and he could have pulled himself back up. Well, they struggled for seven minutes, or several minutes in the panic of trying to get him back up, and he was just afraid to move. You can imagine, you know, there you are. If you're afraid of heights at all, or if you're up that high, you just freeze sometimes. I've had that happen to me, not where I was gonna fall, but where I just, I couldn't move. I'd look down, and I was working on a scaffolding at an a assembly building that we were building um, when I was in the other church. And I was up about 30 feet. I climbed right up. When it was time for me to make that transition, I froze because I looked down. But he was well aware of the height. He wasn't afraid of heights, but he knew what would happen if he let go. So here's this man hanging on. They finally got him up and into the scaffolding. What do you think the first thing he did was? He hooked that safety harness on, and he wears one to this day. He was very fortunate. Many times we look at things as restrictions Many of my friends that I've talked to that are in the world will say, the commandments are restrictive. Keeping the commandments of God is not an easy thing to do if you haven't been used to living that lifestyle and they seem restrictive. 
The Sabbath, when I first started keeping it, seemed very restrictive to me. But I knew this was what God requires. You know, the company that that, that man works for requires that he wear that safety harness. It's a requirement. He almost lost his job over that. He could have lost his life. That would have been even worse. You can find another job. So keep this in mind as we read through Proverbs 7. And ask yourself, is there safety in wisdom? Or is wisdom in knowing the one true God and knowing what he requires of us, is it restrictive? Let's begin in Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1, it says, My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, I want to stop there for just a moment, and I want to back up and look at verse 1, because we're, this Proverbs changes topics numerous times, and this is a continuation of Proverbs 6. But we look here where he says, My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. We've talked about this so many times, about the commandments being in us, haven't we? Many, many times. You know, the, the Ten Commandments we've talked about, we were studying here in the past few weeks in Sabbath school, the Ten Commandments were where? They were inside that treasured Ark of the Covenant. It was made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. The law was inside that Ark. And this should be impressed upon our minds and inside of this vessel, in our heart. And the task of committing the Ten Commandments to memory, just knowing them, just being able to cite them, is that enough? If I can say the commandments and I know them off the top of my head, is that enough? No, just knowing them isn't enough. You know, it's interesting when I read through the commandments and then as I read through the book of Exodus, after God had verbally given the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, just a few chapters later, we see that God sits upon the very substance of what the commandments were carved from. We've talked about this before. But I want to show you something in, in uh, Exodus chapter 24. Take a look at this. This is from the modern King James Version. It says, And Moses went up, and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, that's under God's feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone and as the essence of the heavens for clearness. And upon the nobles of the sons of Israel, he did not lay his hands. Also, they saw God and ate and drank. And Jehovah said to Moses, come up to me in the mountain and be there. And I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written so that you may teach them. So I want you to notice here in, in the previous verse, in verse 10, it says, under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. I know we've talked about this before, but I think this is really important. And then we look here and it says, I will give you tablets of stone. It's interesting if you look this up in the Septuagint, what it says. It doesn't say, I will give you the tablets of stone, or I will give you tablets of stone, but here's what it says. Look carefully at that word stone. It says, I will give you tablets of the stone. Tablets of the stone. You see, the commandments are the very foundation of the throne of God. That's what they are. And what we're saying is that the foundation of the throne of God, when we, when we think of God and the commandments come to mind, we should think about the personality of God. We should think about the love of God, the mercy of God, the justice of God, his character, his principles, all of these things should come to mind when we think about the Ten Commandments, not just a restriction. 
It's not something that restricts me from anything. You know what it restricts me from? Immorality. From sexually transmitted diseases. From the being in court because maybe I stole something from somebody. It's a protection. It's not a hindrance. So when we read there in Proverbs 7, verse 1, My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Just as they were in the Ark of the Covenant, they should be in this vessel. We'll talk more about that as we go through Proverbs 7. If you look here at verse 2, it says, Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Have you heard that expression, that's the apple of my eye? You know, if you, if you ever get real close to somebody, I'll never forget, it was the neatest thing. Uh, um, Mary's daughter, Leah, had, was holding a Bible, I believe, and looking at it. What, didn't that come from her, that picture? And she was looking at the words, Holy Bible. And someone zoomed in close enough at, the, at her eye that you could read the words that were on the front of that Bible. Remember that? Is that on the Facebook page somewhere? It's on the Facebook page. Now, naturally, when you see it, it's a reflection, so it's backwards. So what the photographer did was, once he had made the photo, he reversed the photo so that you could read what was on the pupil of her eye. And what this is saying, when it says, keep my commands and live and my law as the apple of your eye, it literally means as the center of your sight, the pupil of your eye, not just the apple. So when they talk about the apple of your eye, an apple has a what inside? It's called a core. It's called a core. You eat all, everything around, and what's left? The apple core. It's the center of the apple. So if something is the apple of your eye, it's like the core of that apple. You've benefited from taking in the food, and now you have that core that's left. And that's what, how we should treasure those commandments. They should be at the center of who we are. We should see them, and it, we should be a reflection of those commandments, which makes us a reflection of the character of God. Verse 3 in Proverbs chapter 7, it says, Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. You know, binding them on your fingers. You know, this has, a, has to do with our grasping. What, we use our fingers to pick things up, to grasp. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. You know, when it talks about the tablets of stone, were they just written on or were they engraved? They were cut. It wasn't just writing. They were cut. The sapphire stone from which those commandments were on were engraved with the commandments. This also goes to, when we look at this and we think about how this is, remember the other week we talked about the in one of the chapters, I can't remember which one it was, but we talked about the Jewish people and how they had the tefillah or the tefillin. You remember what that was? It was a little box that they would take and they would put little notes from the Torah. I have a picture of it here for those of you who may not have been here. And they, put this, they write scripture. Some of them will write the commandments. Some will write verses from the Torah and they'll put it in that box. And it has to sit within a certain spot on your head. This is what the Jews would do. And you notice the young boy there that's on your left, he's got this band around his arm and he's got that little box. So when it's talking here in chapter 3, Solomon was well aware of this Teflon and he knew about these things being written. If you've got that in your hand or you've got it here, it's hard to forget. It's a reminder. It's a reminder. And you know... I want to back up for just a moment when you think about the apple of your eye and those things. Think about if something gets in your eye. You know, we were talking about those safety glasses and what a hindrance they can be, but how safe they can be. We can't bear the smallest speck in our eye. The tiniest little thing that gets in your eye, it's an irritant. It really bothers you. So we need to be aware of allowing anything in through our eyes. Because even though we may not feel it physically, it can hurt us mentally and emotionally if we see things that we're not supposed to be looking at. Things that we put before our eyes, things that we bring into our minds, into our ears, 
things that we hear, things that we touch when it talks here about bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. You know, I think about these things, writing them on your heart. And the beautiful thing, this Teflon, they used to do this, and some Jews still do this today, but it's not necessary. Why is that? Because it says here, write them on the tablet of your heart. That's not external. That's not something that we wrap around our finger or put on our head. This is internal. This is internal. So it's not necessary to, for us to write them on our hearts. Why? Because God promised that he would do that. We should have this engraved in our heart. I want you to, no to notice this verse, and it's one that we've read many, many times. We're going to read it again. It says, Behold, the days come, in Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He cuts a covenant. Remember, we talked about that once before. When he arced those things into the stones, he cut the stones. You ever cut a deal with somebody? Say, I'm going to cut a deal with that guy. That's what God was doing. He was saying, here's yours and here's mine. This is between us. This is our contract. I'm going to cut this deal. And the men said, we'll do it. Hopefully we are willing to do it and we'll follow through. But he says, I will cut a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I cut with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant of mine they broke, although I was a husband, husband to them, says Jehovah. You see, he wrote it on stone, didn't he? And he gave it to them. He cut that covenant with them. He gave it to them. But they didn't keep it. They broke it. That's what it says. Notice the next verse. But this shall be the covenant that I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Jehovah. I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So when it tells us here to write these things on the tablet of your heart, it's interesting that one of the translation literally translates it, I will engrave these things on your heart. If it's engraved, it doesn't easily go away. You know, in the book of Acts, they were arguing over circumcision. Remember that? We studied that not long ago. But it says we have to have circumcision of the heart. It wasn't the actual circumcision. It was a figurative circumcision. When you circumcise, is something cut? You cut away skin. When you circumcise your heart, you're cutting away any wickedness. So when Jehovah says, I will cut a covenant, he's trying to cut away anything that's in our heart that's undesirable to what his will is. That's what he's doing. And I love this. I read this text to uh, my home nurse the other day where it says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And she says, that just gives me chills. She says, I love that, that God wants us to be his people, that he wants to be our God. And, um, you know, we need to pray for that lady. Her name is Sydney, and I'm usually her last stop. Uh, she sees me once a week until I'm out of the woods, so to speak, but I'm her last stop, and she, I think she does it that way on purpose because typically she spends about 30 to 40 minutes with people, but I witnessed to her for an hour and 45 minutes on Thursday. And so it's just, it's wonderful when people hear these things. She's told me for the last three Sabbaths, we've, we talked about the Sabbath rest. We talked about the commandments. She asked me what I was preaching on this week, and I told her Proverbs 7. That's how we ended up here. I said, I'll just share with you a couple of the things I'm going to talk about. And she said to me, the last three Sabbaths, when sundown Friday came, I just rested, and I've spent that time doing spiritual things with God, and what a blessing I've had. This is a lady that goes to a secular Sunday church and just after a couple of conversations, she's come to the conclusion that I need to take this time to rest. Amen. It's wonderful. That's having it engraved in your heart. You see, for some people it starts sooner than others. Some, it just it took me years. But she saw it and she's applying it. 
write them on the tablet of your heart. Engrave them on the tablet of your heart. Verse 4, it says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin. You know, most, I, I don't have any sisters. Um, I'd say Mary is probably the closest thing to a sister I have, and I torture her sometimes. I think that's what brothers do to their sisters. But you know, if somebody tried to hurt any of you who have sisters, if anyone, if you're a brother to a, a sister, if anyone tried to hurt your sister, you would do anything you could to protect her. And I feel that way about Mary. I wouldn't want anybody to, to try to hurt her. So when it says, say to wisdom, you are my sister, it's saying, say to wisdom, you are my protection, is what it actually says. Is it wise to wear a safety harness when you're up 27 stories? Is it wise to wear safety glasses if you're going to use a cross-cut saw? You see? So all of these things are wisdom. They're protection for us. They're safety in wisdom, we could say. They're safety in having the commandments of God. Verse 5 says that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. You know, when the heart is filled with the love of what is good, that's when we have the commandments in our heart. Because God has put those things on our heart. And we're armed against the seductions of the world. And that's why they say they keep you from the immoral woman. Now, Solomon here is literally speaking about a harlot. And we'll see that in the next verses as we, as we read through this chapter. He's talking about being protected from a seductress who flatters with words. But you know, in the Bible, in Bible prophecy, we know that a woman is talking about a church. And we know that there is a pure woman and there is a vile woman, we could say. Wisdom protects us from the vile woman. And Paul talked about people that would be listening to ones who wanted to tickle their ears with the things that are pleasant to hear. Ed was talking about a sign on the church down the road here that made him do some study in the last couple of days. And basically the sign is tickling the ears of those who are not living according to the commandments, it seems. I'll have to pay attention to that sign. I usually read it, but I, I, I haven't in the last couple of days. So there is a seductress who flatters with her words, that's a church. We need to be careful of those things. We need to be careful that the things that we speak from this platform and in that Sabbath school and when we're out among the community only reflect what God's will is and not what our own will or the will of someone else. So let's continue reading here. In Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 6, it says, For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice. Uh, some say casement, talking about a casement window. A lattice sometimes is, if you, I have lattice work under my deck, and isn't that like a crosshatch pattern sometimes, or different patterns that sort of protect a little bit from the sun? It makes it sometimes where I can see out, but you can't see in. Okay, so I looked through my lattice, it says, and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding. And that happens when we're young, when we're inexperienced. The more experience we get, the more wisdom we get, the more understanding we have. Verse 8, passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house. Remember, we're talking about an actual harlot here, and Solomon's giving warning about this. But I want to apply this too to a church. Think about how this applies to us today, not just in the world and how we interact with people, but in our worship to the one true God. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and the dark night, and there, there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. I mean, she's wandering around all the time. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face. She said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. 
So I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. And I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I want to stop there for a minute. Because as I look back through this and I think about these things, you know, she's lurking at every corner. She caught him and kissed him with, an, with a shameless face, she said to him. I have peace offerings with me. You know, when I hear the messages of a lot of churches and it's always love, love, love. It's always something that's peaceful. It's never something that calls us and holds us accountable for what we're doing or what we may be doing. We want to hear some of those messages, but it can't all be those messages. We have to be held accountable. I have to be held accountable. So, verse 15, I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. Let me tell you, Satan doesn't just sit around waiting for you to do something wrong. He is diligently seeking to devour you. Isn't that what the scripture says? He's like a roaring lion. He's not just sitting there saying, well, I'm going to wait for Mark to mess up, and then I'll get him. No, he tries every day, every single day. He's trying to kick the door down and come in. And then verse 16, I've spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. What do you know about Egyptian linen? If you go to a store to buy nice bed sheets, Egyptian cotton or Egyptian linen are the best. Isn't that true? Very fine, very smooth, very comfortable. Egyptian linen. It was that way then. It's still that way today. And this is basically a seduction that's taking place. That's what he's talking about here. Look at verse 17. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. So here we have this seductress, this church we could say, if we want to give it a modern day application, or it could be something in the world that, we, that appeals to us. It might be something, maybe a place that I like to go, where there are things happening that we know in our mind that God doesn't approve of, but we go there anyway thinking, well, it's really not going to affect me. Let me tell you, when you see certain things and when you smell certain scents, have you ever smelled something that maybe when you were a kid it, it kind of took you back to a moment in time as an adult? You, you're, here you are as an adult and you walk into a house and you smell maybe something cooking and all of a sudden, I remember my mom used to make that when I was a little boy. Hasn't that happened? I think you've talked about that, Mary. So here I am at 51 years old, I can smell something and it takes me to when I was five. Instantaneously, it shows the power that's in our senses. And this is what Satan uses to seduce us as this harlot was seducing this young man. Whether it's with our touch, with what we see, with what we smell, with what we hear. These are very powerful tools that the devil uses. Verse 18, Proverbs 7. Come, let us, fill our, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Wow, this is, sounds like the lure of the world to me when I read through this. She says, for my husband is not at home. So this woman is an unfaithful woman. Just like the, the church that's talked about in the Bible is an unfaithful church. Committed adultery. We're talking about infidelity. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. In other words, the appointed day was a point of time. It could have been at a full moon or at a new moon, something like that. Verse 21, with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of stocks. In other words, of shackles. Flattering lips, tickling those ears, telling people what they want to hear, making it comfortable for me to sit in church and hear, you're good, you're good, you don't have to change a thing. Jesus loves you, he'll forgive you wherever you are. It doesn't matter how you act, what you do, where you are, who you are, what your gender is, what your sexual... Uh, preference is 
whether you're transgender, this is what churches are preaching. Not all of them, but more and more. Verse 23, let's back up. It says in verse 22 at the B part, it says, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. There's, there's safety and wisdom. There's safety and wisdom. A wise person would not put themselves in this position. They wouldn't let it happen. He did not know it would cost his life. He noticed there an arrow struck his liver. Liver is a vital organ. It's vital. Is the heart a vital organ? Absolutely. So if I have the commandments in my heart, is my heart protected? It sure is. But if I don't have them, I'm exposed to the elements of whatever wants to come in. Verse 24, now therefore listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Hell is Sheol there. That's the Hebrew word, so it's talking about the grave. So when I read through Proverbs 7, and I think about it as a, a modern day church, or even as what we literally read here, these things that are happening, and I look at the world, I do find that there is tremendous safety in wisdom. There's safety in wisdom. It's not restrictive. It may seem that way at times. We might feel that we're being restricted when we want to do certain things, if I want to go to a certain place. But like that man that was on that scaffolding, when that bird came and he fell over the side, you know, as long as he has that harness on, he doesn't have to worry about that. Because there, there is a safety harness. Wisdom is like that safety harness for us.